you speak the last time. <laughs> okay, anybody further than you? Okay, anybody? Uh, anybody? I think I saw a hand over here. All right, so uh, that sounds like Sylvia, you win the. Uh, did, did I see there was a prize? I forgot. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's tons of opportunities. Next slide, please. Next slide, uh, please. All right, terrific. So um, uh, here's the agenda for tonight. Uh, we're, mix we're mixing things up a bit. As I said in my emails uh, to announce the uh, uh, agenda, it's, uh, there's a lot about Pluto, and for obvious uh, reasons. Pluto was very much in the news with the uh, New Horizons uh, um, uh, spacecraft. And um, you will see uh, uh, that uh, New Horizons and Pluto throughout to, to, uh, tonight's uh, presentation. So uh, Dave Chisholm is uh, going to be talking about uh, Ottawa skies for this month. Uh, Dave is uh, taking this on. This is Gary, uh, Gary um, uh, from Gary. So thanks, thanks for that to Dave. I appreciate that. Uh, Al Scott, obviously 10 minute astronomy uh, news, uh, news update. Uh, Brian's going to talk about, Brian McCall's going to, you're going to see him a couple of times tonight uh, talking about Pluto, observing Pluto, and he's got a, co got a couple of images to share with us. Um, you'll also see him later on when we uh, talk about um, the uh, uh, observer challenges. Okay, so remember that when we used to have basically have uh, uh, um, a member would uh, make, make a challenge to uh, other members about observer op objects. Well, we're doing it at two levels now. We're not just doing it for the advanced observer, we're also going to be doing it for a, the, uh, the novice observer as well. All right, so give, give you a bit. So hopefully we can learn from that if you're, uh, if you're newer to astronomy. Mm -hmm. Simon, we all know Simon. Simon's going to be talking about. Uh, well, I mean, with all the data that we've been hearing, all the news about the um, New Horizons and Pluto, he's going to be sharing his, uh, sharing his, um, his crazy uh, speculations. Cra uh, crazy speculations. There you go. Um, about uh, Pluto and the uh, Simon. Simon, you always say geology, geoscience. I always think geo is Earth. Okay, I struggle with that. Geoplutonic. Geoplutonic. Yeah, why not? Let's okay. invent words. Let's do that. Um, <laughs> Okay, Bill, there's, there's been a couple of uh, changes on the observer programs, so Bill's going to talk about that. And uh, a couple of interesting announcements. Maybe I'll say one of them right now, because in case I forget it. So starting in October, okay, we're going to be starting these meetings at 7.30 in the evening. Okay, and there's a couple of reasons for that, in case you're wondering. So instead of starting at 8 p.m., we're going to start at 7.30 uh, p.m. The first reason is that we have this, um, this uh, room here, um, We've, um, we're, there's really no guarantee that we have it beyond 10 p.m. So the museum has told us, and apparently this has been in, in the contract for, for many years, that they can in fact come to us and tell us that we need the room at 10 p.m. So this, uh, that might happen. Okay, I don't know, if it's, it might be a very rare event when that happens. We want to start it earlier. The second thing is I think some of you can appreciate. It gives us an opportunity to have a post-meeting social event. Okay, so that uh, we can get to uh, Perkins or, uh, or at least chat more um, after the meeting. And of course, for those of you who had a long week, it's an opportunity to get home, or even for some of the diehards, it's an opportunity to start observing. And so, um, 7.30 p.m. starting in, uh, in October, and I'll, I'll, I'll update the web and so, and, and so forth. Okay, so let's, uh, next slide, please. Bob, I'm gonna need to get the clicker from here. A couple of new members here. Uh, Darren, a good child, and Adrienne Chen. Adrienne, are, are, and Darren, are you here tonight? Yeah. Hey, uh, Darren, welcome. So we're going to be talking about, you, you may already know this, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you've attended previous meetings, we're going to be talking about, you know, membership benefits and so forth. We're going to be talking about some of our star parties, one of which, you know, if the weather holds, will be tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Um, so I think there's a lot to offer, and I'm curious uh, what, uh, well, I always like to hear what, uh, what, what, uh, what interests you. Okay, what, what brought you here? Uh, because we're, we're constantly thinking, you know, are we offering enough to, to, uh, to new members, you know, um, and we, 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 frankly, we want to be able to keep them, okay, and to make it make it make a worthwhile association. Uh, All together, 31 new members, so thank you. Next slide. Okay, um, Dave, uh, one of our uh, speakers, is going to be, uh, uh, was recently in, uh, in front of the uh, Greenwich Meridian, and does anybody see what jacket he's wearing? Yeah. Of course, he took this. Uh, he took this with um, our Ottawa Center jackets. So, Dave, uh, well done. That's uh, that's nice to see. That's the spirit. Um, Dave, when you get up here, maybe you can say more about that. Um, uh, next slide. Actually, Dave, you're going to be up here right now. So, Ottawa skies. Uh, Dave, thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had an opportunity to uh, go to the UK with uh, my wife, Robbie, and one of his friends, and 
course, didn't want to miss the, uh, the uh, Greenwich Observatory, and that was uh, really well done. Uh, what I really liked was in the planetarium, they actually had uh, a real live astronomer do the presentation, which is so much better than most of the ones today where they just uh, show a film. And he actually sat around, there were school kids there, they had a question and answer for 45 minutes after the show. So it was, it was really well done. So the Ottawa skies uh, for this month. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the, uh, the phases of the moon for this month. And on the 29th of August is our full moon. And the good news is uh, we have a new moon on the 14th. The Perseids are coming, peaking on the 13th. So we've got very good uh, viewing opportunities uh, for that. And hopefully we'll have uh, clear skies as well. Next slide, please. Mercury is uh, not visible this month. Next slide. And the Perseids, uh, good viewing are in the early hours of August the 13th, but they, they, they will be good either side of that date as well. And uh, this, is, this is a result of remnants from the Comet Swift Tuttle. Uh, Venus, uh, next slide please. Uh, Venus and Mars are not uh, visible this month. Neither is Jupiter. Next slide, please. We're going to move quickly through here. This is not a good time of year for planets uh, this time. Saturn is visible all month, and uh, it, it's going to be uh, lower, getting lower and lower in the sky. Uranus and Neptune, next slide, are both uh, visible all month. Um, I haven't put Pluto back into the slides. Maybe I'll do that with the, all the interest around Pluto. It's also visible uh, this month if you can see it. Hopefully somebody will tell me how to see it on uh, this meeting tonight. Next slide, please. International Space Station, um, August the 16th is the best view in time. Uh, it's at a reasonable hour as well, 9.07, and uh, it uh, rises to 79 degrees. And next slide shows roughly the path where it travels across the sky. And next slide, this would be an interesting uh, puzzle for somebody to do. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Next slide, please. Okay, up we have uh, Al Scott with the 10-minute uh, astronomy news update. Oh, for any bets on what you're going to talk about? Uh, wrong. Greetings. So um, Mike asked me to do a little bit of an overview of uh, the New Horizons mission uh, and its flyby of Pluto. So when I was researching this, I started getting uh, off topic and there was all these other interesting things as well. And I thought, well, maybe I should just present all the interesting things that are going on in the solar system right now. So I have a kind of a breakneck 10-minute uh, review of the solar system and all the robotic probes that we have going on right now taking really amazing data and sending it back to us. So let's go to the next one, please. So this is from the uh, Mars Science Laboratory, which is a lander on Mars, launched in 2011, plutonium powered. MSL continues to explore the geology of Mars using its extensive tool set. Three of the insets shown here are interesting specimens, uh, only a few centimeters across. These magnified images were taken by the Mars hand lens instrument which is meant to provide information comparable to that uh, gleaned from a geologist's hand lens. So you can see um, that one on the upper right, lower right and lower left are all magnified images of minerals. So far, no fossils. Next one, please. Uh, I spoke about the Philae lander on Rosetta coming back into contact after being dormant for several months. Well, Philae has been quiet since July 9th raising the possibility that it has shifted position in its uh, ditch or wherever it is or it has died. However, they have got a lot of information back from it. They've found uh, complex organic molecules on the surface of the comet, acetone, uh, various long chain carbon molecules. Launched in 2004, the solar powered Rosetta orbiter has been moved back from the comet to an orbit of about 170 to 190 kilometers distant due to problems with dust confusing the star trackers at closer range. So we may have heard the last from Philae, it's uncertain yet, um, but still the orbiter picking up some very cool images of a, of a comet becoming active. Next one please. Uh, 
The solar powered Dawn Orbiter uh, launched in 2007, imaged the minor planet Vesta in 2011-2012 uh, in the asteroid belt. Then it used its futuristic ion engine to rendezvous with and orbit Ceres earlier this year. Ceres, of course, is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Ceres has an interesting feature on it, famous bright spots in the bottom of one of the craters. These, have, these were actually seen by the Hubble Space Telescope, it looked like this huge bright spot. That, that they, they don't know what they are. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation of what they are. At the bottom of Ceres' Ocator crater, they appear to be sublimating material into space. There's a little bit of a haze in that crater. And the crater itself is 92 kilometers wide. Uh, this new information would seem to bolster the argument of people who think Ceres bright spots are composed of ice rather than some sort of salt. So interesting, there's been some ice perhaps that's been cleared off at the bottom of this crater and is slowly sublimating until it'll get covered with dust again. Also on the left, you can see a, three, a five kilometer high mountain dubbed the Pyramid, which features a flat top and white streak flanks as though material is cascading down on it from above. Some areas are less densely cratered than others on the series, suggesting that there are geological processes that erase some of the craters. So very interesting uh, probe there. Go to the next one, please. Plutonium-powered Cassini, launched in 1997, completed its initial four-year mission to explore the Saturn system in June 2008, after arriving in 2004. Imagine launching a robot in 1997 with the technology of that date and then having to communicate with it in the present, writing new software for it on your old DOS machine or whatever it is that you built that software on, uploading it at a few bods, whatever was available at the, at the time, and still getting this stuff back. It's amazing that it's still working. It completed its first extended mission called the Cassini Equinox mission in September 2010. The Cassini Solstice mission extends the healthy spacecraft's life beyond the May 2017 Saturnine summer solstice. Here we see a giant impact basin, Odysseus, on Saturn's moon Tethys on the left in false color. Do you have a laser pointer? Uh, I do not. Mike has one. No? Oh, that's okay. Anyone so Tethys is the moon on the left. Laser pointer right now? Brian. Brian. Well done, Brian. Silver. Uh, the Boy Scout. <laughs> so this is Tethys, and there's this Odysseus impact basin, which stands out in false color. It's imaged in UV, green, and infrared. The moon Tethys is 1,062 kilometers in diameter. On the right, we have an image of craggy Dione in visible light. Dione is 1,123 kilometers across, and you can see the ring of Saturn in the background behind Dione, which is just there. Beautiful image. Go to the next one, please. Now, onto New Horizons. Launched in 2006 as the fastest man-made spacecraft ever launched, Plutonium-powered New Horizons got a gravity assist while passing Jupiter in just over a year after launch. New Horizons has now passed Pluto, going roughly 13.8 kilometers per second and is sending back data from its close flyby. With NASA approval, the mission may be redirected to other Kuiper Belt objects and they're searching for the, the best ones to rendezvous with right now. Pluto is the largest of the Kuiper Belt objects, which is a series of icy objects out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Right now, New Horizons is not the fastest probe that we've launched. Uh, right now, the Voyager probes are both going faster than New Horizons, and that's because of the multiple gravity assists they had with the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and, the other, and one of them with uh, Neptune and Uranus as well. It's actually, the fastest one is Voyager 1, which is moving at 17 kilometers per second and showing me twice the distance uh, that New Horizons is. The Voyagers were launched in 1977 and are also still operating and sending back data. Imagine that in the face. Pluto has a diameter of 2,372 kilometers. 
and a retrograde rotation with an axial tilt of 60 degrees. So it's really lying on its side and rolling around its orbit. A day on Pluto lasts 6.4 Earth days. We see here is a global mosaic of Pluto in, in pretty close to true color. This is what you would see if you were there. The plains of what they call Tombaugh Regio, right here, named after the discoverer, are composed mostly of solid nitrogen ice. The western globe has been nicknamed Sputnik Planum. The dark area west of that is named Cthulhu Regio, uh, being the god of the underworld. All of the uh, features here are also named after uh, underworld creatures. <laughs> or that, that's one of the options available. Now these have not been adopted officially yet. These are kind of names that the team has, has given some of these areas. The larger dark area at the bottom of the rightmost image is called the Balrog. Anyone is familiar with Tolkien? Next slide. Here's a close-up uh, from the flyby. Evidence of exotic ices flowing across Pluto's surface is shown here. Here we see a mosaic of Sputnik planum. Spectroscopy from New Horizons instruments indicates the presence of nitrogen, ice, carbon monoxide, and methane ice on the surface. Now the temperatures of Pluto's surface, they believe that these ices can flow like glaciers. Of course, at the temperatures of Pluto's surface, water ice would be like bedrock, and it would not flow. It would be very hard. And so the, what they believe is the mountains that you see sticking up through this are made of, of water ice. Can go to the next one, please. Here, on the left, a range of mountains rising as high as three and a half kilometers above the surface of the icy body. These are called the Norgay Monts. Norgay Montes, or Monts? Montes. Montes. And extending into Tombaugh Regio and Sputnik Planum. These plains likely formed no more than 100 million years ago. Tenzig Norgay, of course, was the Sherpa who accompanied Edmund Hillary on the first ex successful expedition to scale Mount Everest. The mountain range on the right is called Hillary Montes, after Sir Edmund Hillary. It lies in the southwestern margin of Pluto's Tombaugh Regio, situated between bright icy plains and dark, heavily cratered terrain. The bedrock that forms these mountains, of course, is probably water ice. Go to the next one, please. Pluto's moon Charon has a diameter of 1,208 kilometers, just over half that of Pluto, and it's tidally locked to its primary Pluto with an orbital period of 6.4 days. The large dark area near the North Pole has been dubbed Mordor by the New Horizons team. The inset shows an area approximately 390 kilometers from top to bottom. And there's a, an interesting uh, mountain inside a hole in one area there. Next, please. These are some of the smaller moons of Pluto. Pluto's moon Nix on the left, shown here in enhanced color as imaged by the New Horizons Ralph instrument, has a reddish spot that has attracted the interest of mission scientists. Hints of a bullseye pattern lead scientists to speculate that it may be a crater. By the time the observations were taken, New Horizons was about 165,000 kilometers from Nix. The image shows features as small as approximately three kilometers across. Nix itself is about 42 kilometers long and 36 kilometers wide. On the right, Pluto's small, irregularly shaped moon Hydra is revealed in this black and white image, taken from the Lori instrument from a distance of about 231,000 kilometers. Features as small as 1.2 kilometers are visible on Hydra, which measures about 55 kilometers in length. Just for perspective, the Kuiper Belt objects that New Horizons may be redirected to are on the order that they've recently been searching for, and it's on its tra current trajectory, are on the order of 33 and 15 kilometers, but they're isolated objects. So the geology and the history of the, the new objects, if it gets to go uh, aim for them, is going to be completely different from the ones in this area. <coughs> go to the next one. This is the final picture uh, of Pluto. Just seven hours after closest approach, New Horizons aimed its long-range reconnaissance imager, Lori, back at Pluto, capturing sunlight streaming through the atmosphere and revealing hazes as high as 130 kilometers above Pluto's surface. 
A preliminary analysis of the image shows two distinct layers of haze, one about 80 kilometers above the surface, and the other at an altitude of about 50 kilometers. Models suggest the hazes form an ultraviolet sunlight that breaks up methane gas particles, a simple hydrocarbon in Pluto's atmosphere. The breakdown of methane triggers the buildup of more complex hydrocarbon gases such as ethylene and acetylene, which also were discovered in Pluto's atmosphere by New Horizons. As these hydrocarbons, more heavy hydrocarbons, fall to the lower, colder parts of the atmosphere, they condense into icy particles that create the hazes. Ultraviolet sunlight chemically converts hazes into tholins, the dark hydrocarbons that color Pluto's surface red. So there's a very interesting chemistry going on. In fact, recently they've shown data that suggests that the density of Pluto's atmosphere has decreased by a factor of two uh, in recent years. They've measured uh, radio waves coming through the atmosphere and they measured the density of the atmosphere and it had been coming up in the, in the years preceding this and now as Pluto moves further from the sun, the atmospheric density is decreasing and they believe that the entire atmosphere may, as Pluto gets further from the sun, freeze out onto the surface in, as ice. So that was one of the reasons why New Horizons was important to get it launched as quickly as it could because of the unique period in Pluto's uh, orbit. I mean, it would not happen again in our lifetimes that this, uh, this atmosphere may exist. So that brings me to the end of this, and hopefully uh, Simon will tell us what it all means later. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for, um, for Al? Somebody at the back? Okay. Uh, oh, there is one here. Uh, Frank, go ahead, please. And by the way, Frank, it's a delight to see you here. Thanks. Uh, what's causing the dissipation of nitrogen that was detected, I think? Uh, a couple of weeks even before they actually started showing photos. It was, I think they found there was a large amount of, uh, uh, there was a large axis of product, uh, molecules uh, leaving the planet and that suggested uh, in a new scientist article that we might not be able to see any surface features on Pluto. I mean, that would have been the worst case scenario. But uh, there were signs of erosion, that there might be erosion on the planet caused by the leakage of some of its content. Very I you heard about that. Um, no, I had not looked into that. Uh, because uh, one of the things I noticed is that on the top of Reggio, there's a lot of nitrogen ice. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you did a concentration plot of the uh, of the leakage of the planet in terms of its the materials that, um, ejecting into space, maybe you could see a you'd see a large red spot on that Reggio. Um, Interesting. So, anyway, I don't know. Maybe maybe you could ask you know, yeah, I mean the nitrogen ice is, is the most abundant of the ices on the surface of Pluto. The, the carbon monoxide and methane are, are more of a trace compared to the nitrogen. So, okay. Any other questions? Just just speak up. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, last uh, meeting they were talking about drilling on Philae, and I was wondering whether and well Philae was going to drill on the comet. Yes. I do that as yet? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, they did transmit commands to turn on uh, some of the instruments and uh, July 9th they, they received confirmation that the instrument was turned on but uh, they hadn't uh, been able to establish a stable link with it and they haven't heard from it since. So that was definitely their plan if they could establish a stable link that they would try to drill into the comet to get subsurface information, but I don't think that happened. Were there, uh, were there any uh, pictures taken of the moon sticks from Pluto? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Just uh, had a thought about what you said earlier about uh, what is your uh, still being active. And I was wondering about the difficulty of uh, Yeah, it's it's quite a challenge to be able to do that. It's an amazing technological feat. The the transmitter on Voyager is only using 20 watts of power to send back its data at 160 bits per second. So 
you know, it, it's on off, and they're using the 70 meter uh, Arecibo telescope, I believe, to, to detect it. So yeah, and, and pointing it back, I think it's stabilized, so I'm, they had problems with, with uh, Voyager 2, I believe, in that they've been having some radiation-induced bit flips in the computer, and it turned on a heater and drained a bunch of power. And, um, but it's still functional as far as they, they're aware. They, they did potentially lose one of the instruments because the heater turned on uh, and overheated it. Strangely enough, but that's what the Tony will do to you. <laughs> Uh, you probably mentioned it, but uh, can, you, can you refresh uh, what, what was, what's the power source in the Voyager? They're plutonium uh, radio thermal generators. It's, it's, it's uh, basically the, the plutonium is, is in there and it's creating heat, and they have uh, thermal thermoelectric generators which generate electricity from that heat. So it's slowly losing power, and there's, they're having to turn off instruments as they lose power. I think they're down to, you know, they have a, a, a schedule, and by 2025, they won't be able to run any of the instruments anymore because of the decay of the, radi of the radiation. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, now to ensure that everyone was listening, I've got a skill testing question uh, for the, uh, for the uh, audience here. And if nobody uh, answers, I'm going to actually pick somebody up from the audience. Uh, and um, by the way, this is open to everyone except people who have observed from the Yukon in the last uh, two months. It's joking, silly. Okay, so who wants to name all five moons? You got to name five. Not, don't, don't name one or two or three. All five moons of, um, of Pluto. Okay, go ahead and speak up. That's one. Sticks, yes. Nix is two. I'm oh, sorry, three. Hydra is three. Sure. Sharon's four. And somebody said the last one. Kerberos is five. Okay, well done. All right, uh, next up is uh, Brian McCullough. He's going to talk about how he observed uh, Pluto. Brian. Brian. It is dark tonight in the auditorium here. Brian can't find the microphone. I don't know how he found Pluto. <laughs> Simon, you're setting yourself up to heckling. <laughs> That's fine. I thought it was coming up after Simon. Why didn't you start? Come to me now. Sorry, I, I got to mix it up here. Do you want to do something first? No, no, you can go. No, it's all right. No, no, you can go. Yeah, oh, okay. Here's your time. Oh, that pointer. So we just have people passing out a uh, chart right now. It's a Pluto finder chart. <laughs> And uh, what we could do is, uh, can we turn the lights up, please, in the room? Because we'll be able to see the slides well enough, and uh, I want people to be able to see the uh, the charts. Basketball. Oh, Bob, can you uh, get the lights up, please? So first of all, before I get started, I'd just like to say thanks to Mike for inviting me to do this, and for Chris Terran, who's not here tonight, for setting up the slides, and also for Bob Hillier. Uh, thanks for driving there uh, this evening. I also have another thank you I'd like to start with is uh, to Dave Chapman of Halifax Centre. Uh, Dave's a great guy, great lunar observer. Uh, he's also the editor of our world famous Observer's Handbook. Does everybody have a copy of this? Who does not have a copy of the Observer's Handbook? Or available to them? Yeah. Even though there's uh, just four and a half months left to go in a year, uh, if you're interested in pursuing uh, astronomy in a little bit uh, deeper context, it's worth uh, ordering one of these from the uh, National Office of the RAS. There's a lot of great information in here and has the finder charts for all of the planets for the, for the rest of the year. And it's just packed with basic information in terms of how to use your, uh, how to use your telescope, how the uh, eyepiece magnification chart works. So there's a lot of great information in there. And I'll show you something about my, uh, my own experience with the Observer's Handbook. I started in the RASC in 1989. So I guess 26 years ago, something like that. Uh, and I, my very first handbook, which I got from uh, Art Fraser, had its cover torn off. Am I allowed to say that on national television here? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if we can go to the first slide, please, uh, Bob. Oh, that this, you leave it to Chris Terry, this is what he does, right? I had no idea. All right. Uh, so I was brand new in the RASC, and uh, that fall of 1989, Clyde Tomba 
the discoverer of Pluto, did a, a tour of the RASC uh, centers all across the country, uh, raising money for his Tomba Scholars Fund. So I sketched him from my seat, and uh, just a little pen drawing that I did at the time, and uh, he was an awful punster. He, he liked to tell, you had to stop him from doing the puns and, and say, okay, let's focus on Pluto now, right? Uh, at the end of the presentation, I went up to him with my brand new observer's handbook, with, got, with the cover missing, and we go to the next slide, please, Bob. And I asked him, would he please sign the Pluto finder chart for that year? Wow. And he looked at me and he said, nobody's ever asked me to do that before. <laughs> so there it is, so that's, uh, we were talking about Pluto tonight, so there's where Clyde, uh, that's where Clyde's orbit and mine intersected, very briefly. Oh, All right. Uh, if we go to the next one, please. All right. Uh, we might need to dim the lights just a bit for here. Just What I want to show you is not too much, but just a, a little bit here. Uh, here's a chart that I took from, uh, uh, Tim, what is this? Stellarium. Stellarium software. Stellarium software, thank you. <laughs> so what we're seeing here is uh, we've got the big hook of... Uh, Boy, I'm forgetting everything right now. Of Scorpius. Okay, so here we have uh, Antares, the heart of Scorpius the Scorpion. There's the three stars in the head of it with Saturn just beyond. But here's the way Scorpius goes with the stinger tail here. Just over here, we have the stars of the teapot of Sagittarius. So here's, here's the handle. Here's the spout. Here's the hat on the teapot, and here's the base of it. And here's the Milky Way like steam coming out of the, uh, the spout, right? Uh, if we, we can see the dark horse nebula right here, with the head of the horse here, and you can see his legs coming down and his tail down here. Uh, but where the teapot is sitting right here, and the center of the Milky Way is just sitting up around here somewhere, but over to the left there's something called the teaspoon of Sagittarius. So actually what it looks like one of these uh, spoons that you eat uh, Chinese soup with. So here's the handle, comes down, and here's the bowl of it right here. What we're looking at in the close-up where Pluto is right now, is uh, there's two stars right here, uh, Psi 1 and Psi 2 Sagittarii, and Pluto is zigzagging right through here. If we go to the next one, please. Oh, good. Okay, that helps a little bit there. Uh, and just while we have it here, uh, the constellation right next door, who knows the name of the constellation next door? We've got Sagittarius, Scorpius, and up top we have the serpent bearer of Ophiuchus, that's right. When I found Pluto in 2001, uh, here's the base of Ophiuchus going on here. There's the two stars, the one, the one, right? Makes a nice even line. This star right here is 20 Ophiuchi. And where I found Pluto was right next door to that. All right, so if we go to the next one, please. All right, so that's the spot, and that's where we're looking for, uh, for Pluto. So you can see it's actually fairly low down on the horizon. So you have to uh, pay attention to what you're doing. All right, and we'll go to the next slide, please. All right, here we go. This is what's in uh, this is what's in the observer's handbook of the RASC, the Pluto Finder chart. And Dave Chapman very kindly gave us uh, permission uh, to use this, and I'll, he also sent me a high-res version, which is the handouts that you have in your hands. So you're going to be able to compare notes later. The way they do this system, uh, of course, it, it looks like it's zigzagging, but of course that's just because we have uh, two planets in motion around the sun, right? Okay, so we have Earth and Pluto moving at the same time. Uh, starts off with uh, the, the months, they just start off with an initial. Uh, of course, it went from uh, March or April, May, May 1st, May 31st, and I had to check, was that June or was that July? It's actually July 10th right here. Uh, the New Horizons, what happened on July 14th? New Horizons yeah. intersected with Pluto, and where it went by, uh, on July 14th, it went by right there. That's where it intersected with Pluto is right there. There's July 10th, there's July 14th. Where we are now uh, is uh, August 7th, so we're sitting right in here. August 8th will be right there. August 9th, you can see the mark for it, all right? The uh, stars, just to let you know, uh, Psi 1, Sagittarii, 2,300 light years away, 2,300. This guy here, Psi 2, is only 372 light years away. So just to put a little bit of a perspective in it. But of course, Pluto is, uh, is right in our faces, comparatively speaking. Okay, we'll go to the next one, please, Bob. Thank you. All right, so here's a close-up of it. So we've got the path coming along. Okay, there was the July 14th encounter with New Horizons. The spacecraft went right along like this. Okay, here we are, uh, July 10th. Uh, that's the 20th. That's the 30th. Uh, 
August 7th, we're sitting right about right here, and I think the 8th is right, going to be right in here. What you want to do if you're looking for Pluto, Pluto is extremely faint. It's really faint. Uh, right now, right now, it's uh, 32 astronomical units away. So 32 times the, uh, the Earth-Sun distance, so 150 million kilometers times 32, that's how far away it is. Um, so it's about four and a half billion kilometers, and it's taking light, it's taking the light that you're seeing, or a radio signal from New Horizons, over four hours to reach us. So it's a fair piece, uh, fair piece away. Uh, there's another good chart that you can look up in the, uh, on the Sky and, Tele Sky and Telescope website. So look there as well. So you use a combination of resources when you're trying to track down this planet. It's extremely faint, as I say, magnitude 14.1. Uh, so this means you're going to have to be fully dark adapted if you want to look up where Pluto is. That means keep the lights dimmed in the house before you uh, go out to observe or uh, work with them off for a while. When I did mine in 2001, I actually did one night where I basically saturated my eyes with darkness, uh, looking in the eyepiece for about an hour and a half. Drove myself badly doing it and wasn't sure what I was seeing and I started to see things I'm sure weren't there. But it, it got me started to thinking, because I tried to uh, looking for Pluto a couple of times, a bit half-heartedly, and I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll look for it tonight, and uh, okay, on to something else. And then I decided at one point, at one point in 2001, I'm going to do this. I want to get the ninth planet. Of course, I, I, I can do something now that most of you probably won't be able to do. I observed it while it was still a major planet. <laughs> no. but, but that was the thing. So I, I decided I wanted to do it, so I, I went about it methodically. And what you can do here, and I'll show you my method in just a second, but uh, we've got some stars here. Now some of these stars here will be kind of bright in the eyepiece. But what you want to watch for is if you can observe over uh, two or three nights so that you can see which is it's basically fine moving Waldo. Right? Because all these stars are going to stay the same in relation to one another. They'll keep their positions. But there'll be Pluto is here, then it's 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 here. It's tracking along. This is how Clyde Toba found it in uh, the constellation of Gemini in 1930. Right? He took a class, uh, played exposure, exposure of Gemini, and then three nights later, took another exposure of the exact same uh, star field, and he put the two plates up on a blink comparator microscope, and the effect of it is when you look at one, then the other, one, then the other, it merges all the stars in your eye, in your eye so that all the stars go together, but if there's a, an asteroid moving, it goes boom, 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 from one to the other, or a comet moving, doop, doop with those sound effects too. <laughs> this, is how we found, this is how we found Pluto moving. This is how I found Pluto moving. Um, so if we go to the next one. Because you heard it? That's it, it was all sound effects. That's right. All right, so when I found it in 2001, I made a chart. So the first night when I went out, um, I made a chart of, I found, the, I found the star field. So I'm zoomed right in now, uh, very closely. Remember that little circle of stars that we saw on the previous slide? Of course, this is 20, uh, or however many years earlier, but so it's the same idea, but I'm zoomed right in on a small, small area. So what I did was I, I took the brighter stars, and this took me some observing on one night, this is where I was out for an hour and a half, and I made a sketch of the star field. I made a sketch of the star field. And I thought, oh, I think, I think one of these is Pluto. I think it was whatever, that one I'll say. And so, but I, I couldn't be sure. But anyway, while I was there, I thought, okay, so I sketched in these brighter stars, one, two, three, four, five, don't ask me how I did it this way, six, seven, and eight. I thought, what I need to do is make myself familiar with the star field. So I gave them street addresses, and that's the way I thought of it. Well, okay, now I'm on, now I'm on a familiar street, and I know everybody's address. So there it is. Uh, when I went out, uh, that was on the 21st, I think it was when I went out. When I went out on the 25th, 26th, 27th, I had excellent seeing conditions. I had a, uh, the previous Halloween, a little witch had dropped her black cape on my driveway. Right, which I found the next day, and I thought, oh, she's lost her cape, but I kept it in my observatory, and that's what I used to put over my head. I used a 10-inch, uh, 25-centimeter uh, Dobsonian telescope from my backyard, and uh, kept all the light out, and it was, uh, I had a spray with bug repellent, and it was, it was deadly under there. It was still 22 degrees, 20, 22 degrees at, uh, at 11.30, 12.30, 1.30 in the morning, all right, or at, at night. So uh, when I got, uh, the next time I went out for the three, three run, Three night run, I found out, oh, it wasn't this one, it was actually the one that had been here had moved to there because I was watching the angles of how everything is in relation to one another. So I checked against my sketch. So I said, oh, I'm sure that's Pluto. 
So the next night I went out. So I start with a low field or low power eyepiece, working just with a, uh, a red dot finder to aim my, my telescope. Uh, and I went up the next night, found it. Aha, it's not in this orientation anymore. It's now it's almost in a straight line in here. There it is. I know I've got it. I know I've got it. I want one more for confirmation. The next night I went out and I just pointed up on my pointer just right near my locator stars. I was going to use my low, low power eyepiece then zero in on the field and then put my high power eyepiece in while well, I just popped it on with the tail red, uh, red dot finder, looked in the eyepiece uh, and, and boom, it was there right away. And I guess there was some kind of muscle memory going on and it, it was, I was right there. And there was not in the line anymore, it was over here. So I watched it one, two, three, three nights in a row. And that's how I did it. If we go back to the previous slide, please, uh, Bob. So you can do the same thing and look at, the, this is what I love about this, over the next couple of days, and we've got the moon is out of the sky, listen to me saying that I'm glad the moon's out of the sky, Yeah. right? But look at this, you've got a little uh, pointer that's almost like saying Pluto, right? So use uh, the patterns of the stars as your, as your guide to find out how you can uh, uh, differentiate between, uh, is it this one, is it that one? If you can identify these, then whatever's left, and if it's moved from one night to the next, I rest my case. Uh, when I saw Pluto, it was only uh, 29 astronomical units away, so not 32 like it is now. And it was only 13.8 magnitude. All right? Um, yep. So that's it. So I ended up working at 127 times magnification when I found it. But it started with a low field. Get your, get your star field. And I'll just leave you with this. Uh, it can be a frustrating uh, thing to search for and to find. So don't be disheartened because if you don't get it this year, you'll get it 10 years from now, okay? <laughs> but the thing is, if you put your telescope on and if you can find, if you go to the next one again, please, Bob, thank you. Oh, oh sorry, I went the wrong way. Yeah. If you can find the little recognizable pattern of stars, Count that as a success, but make sure you've logged it in your book. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Okay, we've got a couple of observer images. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. Keep going, please, Bob. Well, Brian, actually, you didn't speak to these, uh, I don't think. Um, you want to talk to these? Oh yeah, this guy from Thunder Bay uh, went out looking for... Uh, Ron McNaughton, is that right? Ron McNaughton, yeah, great guy. Went out looking for Pluto. So a lot of people have been observing Pluto in the last little while. Last little while. Yeah, I didn't know if you were going to include that on set. Uh, I had a picture from uh, somebody in London, uh, Dale Armstrong, and uh, he had his, uh, his hat and coat and everything on, sitting at the eyepiece. This is, he said the picture somebody took of him while he was observing Pluto. And I thought, well, that's certainly different from what I did when it was uh, 22 degrees at uh, 1.30 in the morning, so... so. He, he observed his one name, it was quite chilly. Can you see it there? Oh yeah, this is the man. Oh, that's it. Okay, yeah, right. Now I remember. I have to uh, always remember. Uh, if we can go back, that's, okay. Pluto. Pluto. Boom. Boom. We're blinking. Great job there, Bob. So we're, you're doing like Clyde Thomas done. He's blinked. And that's how, when, when I saw the two images from... Uh, Ron McNaughton, that's what I did, I blinked them. I just boom, 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 I put them both up. What am I, what's, what's, what's different? What's moved? Uh, Is that it? Terrific, that's it. Oh. All right, um, next please. And again. Okay. All right, observer, uh, observer report. So um, if, uh, next slide please. If uh, Janet, uh, Paul, um, and uh, uh, Bobby, if you could come up here. The first one we've got is um, from, um, from my girl. I actually had the pleasure of meeting my girl just, uh, just uh, last week. And we're talking about Pluto. And um, my girl is, I think many of you know, he's, he's doing his PhD now in, in, uh, in Kingston. And uh, I said, well, can you share some images of, uh, of Pluto? So actually what you're gonna see here, and I asked Paul Clowinger to speak to him, um, is uh, something that was, is, they're, uh, they're still very fresh. They were only, they were only taken, uh, 16 to 17 hours ago, so he uh, he put it all a, a long night. So Paul, why don't you come up and uh, share it? Hi everybody, thanks Mike. Well, uh, I tell you, we've got a lot easier than Brian uh, these days because uh, I'm sure Brian was doing some serious star hopping. I don't know how long it took you to acquire the field and stuff, but. Uh, these days, spoiled with computers, we basically just say, 
go to, go there. So uh, uh, some imaging done here. Uh, Mike, uh, actually Mike and I imaged uh, uh, using a very similar instruments. I'll show you mine in a, in a little while there. But you can see we're blinking the two shots there. And you can see the motion of Pluto. This was shot uh, earlier, this, uh, earlier this morning. And uh, those two images, unlike Brian, who was, in, who was looking for Pluto days apart, with the cameras and the, and the precision that we have now with the scopes, these, this uh, pair of images um, is only an hour apart. Yeah, it's a pretty spoiled. I did the same thing about an hour apart there. And the, the motion is tiny, but you get instant gratification, which is rather nice. Uh, because you can tell right away which of those objects is Pluto because even with large telescopes as you know Pluto only looks like a point of light so yeah it's hard to say in all those which ones are, are Pluto unless you have more than one image so you can see the motion there in in the span of an hour we're talking about an, a movement of less than four arc seconds so very very tiny hey, yes Absolutely. And I'm wondering if, uh, since he just shot this this morning, if this is your little hook? No, just the right. Uh, this guy? Yeah. That's your little hook of stars there. So, yeah, a good, a good reference point, as you mentioned there. So, Mike shot this um, with an 11 inch scope uh, and an SPIG CCD imager. Uh, he, uh, he stacked 10 images uh, of uh, 15 seconds a piece. And uh, for the first one, and then waited an hour and stacked another 15 at, at 15 uh, at 10 seconds a piece. No, I think it said that 10, yeah, 10 images at 15 seconds a piece, I believe. So 150 seconds effective uh, exposure for each of those images spread apart by an hour. So thanks for sending those, Mike. I hope you're watching. Uh, the images look great, and uh, congratulations on bagging the non planet Pluto. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You'll be back up in a moment. Uh, Janet uh, is going to share some of her um, aluminum. Thank you. Well, the goal I set for myself was to try and get uh, the blue moon on July 31st um, in the same view as the ISS. So uh, I took this picture um, at our cottage on uh, Lac Leslie in uh, western Quebec. And uh, I guess it was a roughly about nine o'clock, maybe just a little after at night, and I guess the ISS uh, adjusted its course while I was taking the photograph. I have no idea. But anyway, next slide, please. And then uh, just a close-up. I'm just shooting with my uh, my camera on a tripod, and my lens is uh, uh, 20, an EF24 to 105, so this is about the maximum I can get, but still, I thought it was a nice dramatic shot. Next uh, slide, please. And this one uh, as well, and uh, taking in the reflections on the water. Next slide, please. And this I actually took um, at, in our backyard on uh, Ju July 30th. And again, uh, the task was to try and get uh, the moon uh, with the ISS. And uh, I just uh, I grabbed this one very quickly and then uh, afterwards saw that I had gotten this really nice flare. So it looks like someone on the moon is communicating with the ISS. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Well done. Um, next up is Paul again. Paul Clowinger. Uh, Strange sense of deja vu. So uh, I also imaged Pluto, uh, and this was uh, in, in, the, in the hours uh, before uh, the New Horizons flyby. Uh, but yes, that is my picture on the top right-hand corner there. I had access to a very big telescope. Yeah. yeah, so this is obviously the New Horizons view of the day before the, the flyby. And uh, I took, uh, like Mike, I, I took a, a number of images. Mine were 60 seconds long each, stacked six, waited an hour, stacked another six. And don't blink because you'll miss it, but you'll, if we can get the next one, you'll see the motion. So yeah, Pluto moving uh, in, in an hour, about four arc seconds, so very, very tiny. 
And uh, as you can see, even I've, I've blown this up so it was uh, a little bit uh, more obvious there, but it's a point of light, so it's, uh, it's tiny. But it's pretty cool that we can, uh, we have access to this type of technology where we can image something that's not even as big as our moon at the edge of a solar system and uh, know that's what we're looking at uh, uh, within the same night there. So uh, very, uh, very cool stuff. So yeah, Pluto five hours before the uh, flyby. Next one, please. Also imaged, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, uh, the Milky Way recently. The, this is just done with a 70 millimeter lens uh, and a Canon 60 BA, and you can see, uh, so it's quite a large field there. It's about 18 degrees across. And uh, this is looking towards the central part of the, the, uh, the their galaxy there. Uh, next one, please. You can see some familiar landmarks, the dark lane that cuts across our, our galaxy there, and uh, certainly the lagoon and the terrific N23 at the top. And, core of our galaxy right there buried in that dark, dark cloud of, uh, of uh, dust that obscures the, our views of, uh, our, or at least our visual views of, uh, of getting uh, uh, something from the center. Next one, please. Oh, yes. That's the galactic dark horse. It is the galactic dark horse. There you can see uh, he's trotting up the, up the frame there. There's his head there and his couple legs there. And again, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's enjoying himself there. So yeah, he's galloping up there. That's a really neat formation, and it's uh, this is a really a prime time to to, uh, to check out this area of the Milky Way with uh, with binoculars or a small telescope because these features are very apparent. Uh, unlike Pluto, which is a little trickier to get, uh, this is uh, this is uh, pretty easy to see, and it's uh, really prime time for us uh, uh, at this time of the year to see this. This these objects don't rise very high above our horizon, and uh, so you want to get them when they're pretty much due south. Uh, if you've got a nice dark southern horizon and uh, at a reasonable time too, not at three in the morning or whatever. <laughs> so next one, please. So yeah, this uh, this this image is a stack of um, 35 90 second exposures, just taken with a, as I said with a 60 ba and a 70 millimeter lens on a sky tracker platform. So yeah, just uh, stacking them together. Uh, lots of you get a lot of noise uh, when you do these images down at. Uh, in, in our latitudes, but they still come up pretty good and uh, shows a lot of nice rich detail in, in that part of the Milky Way. So highly recommend it, especially now that the moon's getting out of the picture. If you wait till September, then by the time you're into the dark sky, you're already, this part of the Milky Way is already <clears throat> getting quite low. So really in the next uh, two weeks or so, if you get a chance to go ahead and see this under a dark sky, well worth the effort. Really nice objects. So my final one is that one. And that's the uh, Cocoon Nebula, also up in that area of the sky. It's in Cygnus. The Cocoon Nebula is, is, is a reflection and emission nebula about 4,000 light years from here. And it's about 15 light years across. It's, uh, you can see the reflection, uh, the blue reflection portion of the nebula there, and uh, the, the redder, more intense uh, emission region. Uh, this is an active star forming region. Uh, that nebula is being lit up by that star, which is estimated to be only a, a few hundred thousand years old. So a very young, very young star. Uh, and we know by looking at this uh, nebula with uh, infrared telescopes that uh, these dark filaments here are all active regions of, of formation, uh, star formation. So there are stars and possibly planetary systems forming within the, uh, those, uh, those dark dusty regions currently. Uh, this is uh, an image I took with an 11-inch scope uh, with um, Canon 60DA, and it's a stack of 13 five-minute exposures, so a combined exposure of about 65 minutes. And that's all I've got for you. Enjoy your observing. Next up is Bob Olson. Anybody recognize this boring galaxy? <laughs> Next slide. It was 110, yeah. Uh, I have a new telescope, and uh, I'm having fun with it. And so I aimed it in this area, and when I use that telescope, it's, that's what I get, that little galaxy in the bottom. It wouldn't be very useful taking a picture of this. This is a picture I took a couple years ago with a very short focal length uh, telescope. Okay, next slide. And you can see the, the framing of the uh, image of 110. That's the difference in the uh, two telescopes. That's not exactly true. 
uh, the big picture is a, a, a mosaic of four images. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've seen this a hundred times tonight. <laughs> it's a very popular part of the sky. Um, and uh, this is due south. And the stuff in here is what I was sort of interested. I've imaged it before, but I have better equipment right now. So I thought I'd try and image it some more. Um, this is the one place you can just take a telescope, aim it south, about 15 degrees off the horizon, and you're going to see stuff, even if you don't know what you're pointing at. Uh, it's a fabulous area to look at. Uh, binoculars or small telescope, even a big telescope, you'll just stumble on stuff. Point it up north, you're going to stumble around for two weeks before you find anything. Uh, but this area is fantastic. Now, um, this was taken, as you can see, in July 16th at 10 o'clock in the evening. The same view is about 9 o'clock in the evening now. So uh, things are happening. It's, it's moving a little bit further to the, to the, uh, to the, to the west. Um, and uh, as you all know, next slide, please. Uh, the, um, the view that you would get doesn't include this guy. And so at 10 o'clock, this is what I see. And I'm interested in imaging some of this stuff. And it's heading this way. OK, next slide. So as you know, the sky moves that way. Or really, actually, next slide. The Earth is actually moving this way. And what I really care about, next slide, is the tree is moving this way. <laughs> and uh, in about 11 o'clock or 11.30, the tree is right here. And at 10 o'clock is when it gets dark. So I have a window of about one hour to get these images. And, uh, so that's my window. Next slide. Um, the eagle. Uh, pretty interesting, even in visual. The color, of course, in, in, uh, uh, with uh, color uh, photography, fabulous. The red is uh, mostly just hydrogen. It, well, it's all hydrogen alpha that's been lit up by the nearby stars, uh, ionized into this glowing gas. Next slide. M8, the Lagoon Nebula. Same thing, stars in the middle of that are just lighting it up. OK, next image. The Swan Nebula M17, these are all pretty close together in that same little area heading toward the tree. <laughs> and uh, you can see this was my, my red period. <laughs> you, want, you almost never see this, so much of, of an extension made on the, uh, on the Omega? Yeah, that's right. When you look at it, all you see is this. Yeah. Uh, okay, next slide. And this is the Triffid. You just saw it actually. Paul filmed it. Uh, my camera is probably a little bit more sensitive in, in, uh, in uh, the red than his is. And um, uh, the, the red hydrogen alpha being lit up. And this is a reflect, this is a bright area of reflection nebula. And you notice the sky color. It's colored just like the sky. That's because it's colored exactly like the sky. It's uh, light being bounced off of dust, the same way our sky is blue, same reason. Anyway, thank you very much. Wonderful images tonight from our, our members. Well done, everyone. That's, uh, that's awesome. Okay, before we go to break, Brian, you're, you're going to come back up here um, for this new, or I shouldn't say new, um, we're bringing back the observer challenges uh, uh, section uh, that we had in uh, earlier meetings. So this month we're going to be focusing on the moon. And uh, Brian, where are you? Oh, yeah, we'll we'll do that now, and then we'll uh, then we'll have our our break. Oh, by the way, while Brian's making his way up here, you'll notice we didn't have a members in the news section, um, but there is one member I'd like to mention. Um, come on up, Brian. Um, who um, it was uh, maybe not in the news, but it's still it's a little noteworthy. Uh, Eric LeMay uh, just started with um, with uh, Doug George's company, uh, Diffraction Limited. So uh, well done, Eric. Thanks. Thanks. There we are. Do these lights work, uh, Mike? Um, is there a light here? Oh, there isn't one. There is. Excuse me. Start to see light in my eyes. Um, yes, 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 yes. There is a. Uh... Oh, I'll manage you. Sorry. Okay, don't worry about it. Well, there we go. 
All right, so we've got a couple of uh, lunar challenges uh, that, uh, good idea, I think, for Mike to bring back some of the observing challenges. I think you're looking at doing, what, different ones as we go along? And yeah, that's right. I like it won't that. always be lunar. It'll be, um, we, we can shift it around. So I'm going to be uh, reaching out to members, uh, again, to pair them, you know, one advance, one, one novice. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yep. Okay, so what we've got is we've got two, I think, uh, we've got a, what we call a novice challenge and an advanced uh, challenge. So if we go to the first slide, I don't know which order they're in. Okay, so just to let you know, we'll orient yourselves. Um, uh, thanks to Jonathan Kukan for passing out the, uh, the charts uh, both times here. Thank you very much. Uh, so what we've got here is a picture of the moon as we see it. And of course, you have to remember that the moon libres. All right, because it, uh, it kind of rocks around in its orbit as it goes around, uh, goes around the Earth. So sometimes we see a bit more of the eastern horizon, a bit more of the western horizon. So remember on the, on the moon, north, and south, right, you've got the big basins, uh, Mari basins up to the north, uh, and over on the, as, to the right, as you see it in the sky, where this big round impact basin of Mari Chrysium, the Sea of Crises is, that's the eastern edge of the moon. So north, south, east, and across to the west. Um, so what we're gonna be looking at, uh, I'm calling this uh, black and white at first quarter, because if you checked uh, the, the moon chart that Dave Chisholm was showing, uh, where the moon right now, is divided like this, and all of this is in darkness. So all we see is, la did I say first quarter? I meant to say last quarter, all right? So the moon is just at last quarter now. So only the left-hand uh, side of it is being illuminated at the moment. And what we're gonna be looking for uh, is the, uh, the dark, pretty much the darkest feature on the moon, which is uh, the, the crater Grimaldi, or it's actually a, wall, a small wall plane or an impact basin. And the other one is the, uh, the crater Aristarchus, uh, which is the brightest uh, object on the moon, the brightest feature on the moon. So we're going right in the same general area. We've got the darkest and the brightest. Now, uh, to start with, I'll, uh, we'll start with Grimaldi, the basin down here. And you're going to see all kinds of different uh, uh, measurements for its size. All right? So it's about uh, 140 kilometers in diameter. Uh, and it's actually round, it looks very elliptical here, but if you flew around there and got right over it, it's almost completely, uh, completely circular. Uh, but there are other e exterior rings that go around it that push the, uh, these rocky rings out to about 440 kilometers out from the center. And there's actually a little bit of an opening that goes right into the uh, Oceanus Procolarum here. This is the Mar big Mare Imbrium Basin, and all this is the, uh, the Oceanus uh, Procolarum coming down. So it looks like there might be a bit of a flooding event that went on in there. This is quite an old, uh, quite an old feature, and uh, it's named after an Italian phys physicist and astronomer who made uh, the, he, he actually made the moon map that uh, Riccioli used when he was doing some of the, uh, determining the nomenclature for the, uh, for the moon. So as far as I can figure, this basin probably occurred probably about uh, four billion years ago. And then later on, when, as the moon was, uh, had heated up and the lavas were flowing, flooding up all these other major uh, basins, that's when this flooded up at the same time. Um, the, one of the interesting things about uh, Grimaldi is that it has, it's a site of a mass con. It's a mass concentration or concentration of mass. And some of the spacecraft that have been flying over the moon, uh, as it got over there, noticed they were getting a tug down as they flew over it. So this is, uh, they have very sensitive instruments on the spacecraft just for this. The Apollo astronauts were, uh, for, were checking for this as well, and they also noticed it. I think the Apollo 15 uh, astronauts going around had, uh, had made some note of that as well. Now, if we go up north, uh, to, uh, to Aristarchus. It's a very, very bright feature. And uh, I'll show you in a minute uh, what, what this can kind of look like in a, even in a daytime sky. But uh, for the moment, uh, what we've got here is, uh, you can see there's some major features here. This is a crater Copernicus, right? This is a much younger crater than Copernicus. Copernicus has had time to be space weathered. That means it's, we're getting radiation from space uh, that's interacting with the soils and discoloring the soils. And there's also uh, something called lunar gardening, uh, where you get micrometeorites or even larger bits uh, impacting the surface of the moon and uh, continually chewing up the surface. So it's always a nicely uh, newly gardened, uh, gar gardened surface. This is why the Apollo's uh, astronauts, the moon walkers, uh, their suits that they wore, had to be uh, so many layers thick and tested for micrometeorite impacts because they couldn't have themselves being gardened while they were hopping around the moon. It wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been too healthy, right? Uh, 
one thing about Grimaldi, I'm just going to jump back for a second. It's if you've ever seen the, the the picture of the rabbit on the moon, where you've got the rabbit's ears going this way. Here's the bunny's body. Here's is the back part of his uh, body with his two legs. There's his cotton tail. Grimaldi is the rabbit's nose. So it's one good way to remember it. And up here, you could almost say that Aristarchus could be its eye, if you want to locate it up there, right below its ear. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about Aristarchus, okay, the, it's a crater, it's got a crater there, but it's about 40 kilometers uh, wide, but it's almost three kilometers deep. So, I mean, even when you look up at the moon and it looks, you know, you see some nice features in that, you have to remember there's, there's a significant uh, uh, depth and altitude variation uh, going on there. Uh, something that's really interesting to watch, the, if you had nowhere else to look at on the moon, if you were locked in a jail cell somewhere and you, oh, you only had this tiny little window that showed you one spot on the moon, you could spend the rest of your days exploring uh, the region of the Aristarchus Plateau because the, uh, the plateau itself is about 200 kilometers uh, in, in length and it's about two kilometers high. Right, it doesn't look like it so much, but, it's, uh, but that's what it is. So anyway, so that's what it is. The novice challenge is just to look for the dark and the latest features on the uh, on the moon. All right. Now, before we shift on, uh, I'll sh oh, let's go to the next one, please, uh, Bob. And just to show you, even in a daytime sky, um, I might have to have the lights down just a bit here. I don't know if we can do that. I think I'm good. So here, whoops, there's Grimaldi. If I got it right. It was easier to see on my monitor, sorry. So even in it, okay, does, there, does everybody know how to find the moon? <laughs> oh, you laugh, where's the moon right now? Point to the moon. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's down, somebody's gonna get their, their cell phone out. I think it's, I think it's down that way, right, right now, down this way. But by tomorrow morning, right, it's gonna be back up, it'll be up in the daytime sky. Get your binoculars out, look in the daytime sky, look for dark Grimaldi, look for very bright Aristarchus, you'll see them. Right. Let's go back to the chart, please, uh, Bob. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go on to the um, to Mike Worth's uh, challenge. Mike has been living down in uh, Baja, California, for a number of years. Uh, he's a great uh, observing astronomer. He uses a, a Starmaster 18, 18 inch diameter telescope. Um, a great guy. He and his wife Pam uh, really know how to uh, to host people. If you've ever visited their observatory while they're in, down living near Perth, or if you've managed to get down to Mexico to see them, uh, but Mike's come up with uh, with an advanced challenge for us here, and it's called the Valentine Dome. Next slide. And where it is, it's right here. This is the uh, this is the Sea of Tranquility. So this is where the Apollo astronauts landed in 1969. Yes, and here's the Sea of Serenity. So right here where the Sea of Serenity is about to go into the big uh, Sea of Rains, Mare Imbrium, right there is where the Valentine Dome is. And you'll see that right next to it up here, there's the, uh, the crater Cassini. It's very distinctive with its rings and its uh, impact craters there. And you'll also see there's uh, uh, Aristarchus, or Archimedes, Autolycus, and Aristarchus, th these three here. These actually point the way to where um, the Apollo 15 astronauts landed right in there. Uh, in whatever it was, 71, I think it was, eh? All right, so we're gonna be looking right into this section right here. So let's go to the next one. Okay, do we have, a, do we have another one for Mike? Okay, so there's our area. All right, so that, now we're seeing that, this is the entrance into Mari Imbrium here. Here's the Sea of Serenity. There's the crater uh, Cassini. Okay, all right. So an easy way to find it is if you can find Cassini, and here's the next one is called Thetidis, so you just go straight down, just drop across the mountains. Where it is, it's just down in here. The, uh, the dome, they call it the Valentine Dome. I think it was a, I think it was a Sky and Telescope uh, contributor who named it that. If, um, I'm not 100% certain on that, I've forgotten. And they say, well, it has a bit of a heart shape, but there's also a rill sort of a, a valley, a, 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 an old lava tube that cuts through it. And uh, part of his challenge is to, uh, to find both of these things. Now the dome itself, here it is, thanks Bob. Uh, here's the Valentine Dome, and it rises only about 300 meters above the surrounding plain. Now, you don't often find it called Valentine Dome on your charts, it'll be called Linné, L-I-N-N-E, accent aigu, Linné A. All right, because this other feature that you called Linné B. But anyway, here's the rill that cuts through it. All right, so it's a little uplifting on the surface of the moon. So uh, as Mike says, 
and it's about 35, it's 35 kilometers in diameter. And, uh, and you can find this on the, uh, on the Antonin Ruckel uh, Atlas of the Moon. But here's what, uh, here's what Mike has to say. Uh, to see this dome, the observer has to catch it when it's pretty near to the Terminator in order to have any chance of seeing it in such a, uh, seeing such a low feature. And this holds true for all domes, he's saying. So uh, Mike says, uh, and I hope uh, Mike's able to see this tonight, uh, I would use the virtual moon atlas to plan my best observing dates, so to first quarter or six days after full, right, would be the best time to, to see it. So it's located in the northwest portion of Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity, uh, 35 by 35 kilometer heart-shaped dome, and its height is only 300 meters. The virtual moon atlas and uh, the LAC atlas, the, uh, to the US Air Force lunar atlas, refer to it as Linnae A, as I was mentioning, and just so people do not get confused in trying to find it on, on their atlases. So on, uh, Ruckel refers to it as 23 Linnae. So you're gonna find it on, the, uh, on Ruckel chart number 13, if you, have, uh, if you have that chart. All right, uh, as an added bonus, if people can observe it, they should also try to see if they can detect, and high power helps if the seeing's worth it, detect the small rill that bisects the dome. The rill is hard to see under high sun angles, but with it on the Terminator, right? So we've got the day-night uh, line right there. It might be possible under very good seeing conditions. So he says, good luck with that. And just in honor of uh, Mike and me doing our little lunar thing here, I've got a couple of door prizes. One is this little outdoor plaque you can have of the, uh, of the moon. And this other one is, uh, I, I, I was told I, when I bought it on eBay that it did come directly from the moon. It's called moon cheese. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, and thanks, um, thanks, Mike, as well, who I understand is watching from um, from the West Coast, uh, watching this uh, live over the internet. So, just before we go to break here, uh, next slide. Um, and there is, by the way, there's a picture of uh, Mike. Who hopefully, we'll be back in a couple of months, um, returning to uh, Ontario. Cross our fingers. Next slide. So I wanted to say just a, a few things really quickly about membership, uh, membership and membership benefits. I, I always talk month for those. So for those of you who are um, or are new to this meeting or uh, first time here tonight, um, we do have a number of uh, benefits, including a astronomy book library, a telescope loan library. Next slide, please. Um, we have an observatory uh, for, for 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 members as well. Your, your me with your membership, you get uh, Sky News magazine, which I think many of you know is now owned by the RASC. Um, an electronic version of the uh, RAC journal, or you can pay a little bit more and get a printed version. Um, the Observer's Handbook, which Brian talked about earlier tonight, and, uh, and our center's own um, Astronotes, which is a, uh, um, a um, something released by our center, you know, which is uh, actually quite good, uh, quite very good. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Next slide. So, um, next slide. So um, membership is a regular, these are membership rates. If you have any questions, come see me uh, during the break. I, I, I'd like to encourage um, people who, uh, if you have been coming to these meetings and having come, come to them often, uh, please consider membership because um, there's, there's uh, you know, these things don't come free. Um, so your membership helps us. Uh, and as you'll hear me say later on, we're bringing in some, uh, some, some outside speakers and uh, like we have in the past and, and, and uh, your membership uh, contribution does help. So. If you haven't renewed your membership, please consider. And if you're interested in it, um, well, um, I can tell you more about it uh, during the break. Uh, our first presentation is uh, Simon, who's going to uh, offer his, um, what did you say again, Simon, earlier? Speculations, on uh, ge geological speculations on. Uh, oh, geological speculations. Next slide, please. Uh, from, based on the data from the New Horizons uh, spacecraft. So Simon Hammer. Alrighty. Yeah, did you notice how um, Mike actually censored my original title, which is actually Geological Speculations Based on Minimal Data? <laughs> okay, can we have the first slide, please? If we can bring that up full size. All right, here we go. Okay, over the past few weeks, even if you wanted to, you could not avoid the news from NASA's New Horizons mission and its flyby of the dwarf planet Pluto. And the images beamed back to Earth have given us a tantalizing first look at the surface of a member of a well-populated class of objects, dwarf planets, that inhabit the outer reaches of the solar system beyond Neptune, within the Kuiper Belt, and possibly within the enclosing Oort Cloud. Next one, please. 
technological constraints limit the rate at which the new images can be transmitted to Earth. So right now, we only have a minimal number of images compared with recent missions that have been, 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 been sent to other uh, uh, solar system bodies. Let's skip this one, let's the, the, the skip that one altogether, let's go to the next one. There we go, that's good. And let's, let's stay in that format, that way we won't run into trouble. Um, that's right, as I was saying, even though some of these images, though not all, are of excellent quality, NASA and its associated scientists are currently being very strangely reticent to spell out what they think these preliminary observations might mean in terms of the geological evolution of Pluto and its moon Charon. Those of you that know me will know that I don't suffer from any, kind of, uh, any such kind of coyness. So I'm not going to hesitate to arm way vigorously and speculate. Here's what the pluton Charon system looks like in true color. I believe the size is at a scale, but I'm not sure about the distances. Next one if we can. Thank you. Now this image gives you a good idea of the size of Pluto and Charon. Pluto, of course, is the bigger one. That one and that Charon and its shadow. Compared with the Earth, note the size is a scale, but obviously not the distances. Next slide, please. So for those of you that prefer, here's Pluto and Charon compared with the size of our moon. This would be our moon, there's Charon, and there's Pluto. And the object of the exercise here is to emphasize just how small Pluto is. This is very important. Next one, please. Previous knowledge of Pluto's size and mass, and therefore its density, have been refined by the data from the flyby, nothing revolutionary, thereby confirming this model of the internal structure of the dwarf planet. It's still theoretical, of course, it's just a model. But the idea is that there's probably a large rocky core, that would be this gray thing here, surrounded by a mantle of water or slushy ice, maybe even an ocean and an outer crust of various compositions. Next one, please. So what about the dwarf planet's surface? What actually is it made of? Well, Alan already pointed out to us that it turns out to be coated with various ices, including methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and water. That's an intriguing one. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Interestingly, that New Horizons probe measured significant spatial variations in the concentration of methane and carbon monoxide ices. You can see here there's a concentration of carbon monoxide. And here there are variations between the, the red and uh, the, the green colors here. Variations in the concentration of methane on Pluto. But interestingly, it didn't actually directly measure water. Come back to that in a moment. Instead, the presence of water ice is a deduction from visual observations, as I'll show you later in the talk. Next one, please. Good. Now, as, a, as the first well-resolved uh, images were received from the approaching probe, planetary scientists got a few surprises. The surfaces of Pluto and Charon are quite different from one another, and not just in size. The scale bar there is about 1,000 kilometers, and that scale bar there is about 200. Al's already pointed out in detail the difference between the, the, the two. Pluto has many intriguing features, including bright and dark areas and mountains, as Al showed you. In other words, positive relief. While Charon is darker overall, it has a dark polar ice cap, and it has chasms more than anything else. In other words, negative relief. Next one, please. Now, tonight, I'm going to focus principally on Pluto. In this image, you can see three principal components illustrated. The first is that there's a broad band of dark material. See this image here? This is a, a, a diagrammatic image of the, the, the projection. That is the equator. That would be the North Pole. So the North Pole would be here, here, and this would be the equator here and here. It's an oblique, oblique view. And this is dark material here. You can see it in this image too. Most likely hydrocarbons confined to the equator. For the moment, no one's speculating on what it's doing there, but I will in just a moment. <laughs> Second, there's an oblique band. That's this thing here. An oblique band of, as NASA says, these are NASA's labels, by the way, not mine, complex patterns. Now, I'm not really sure what to make of this for now, but it clearly contains some circular bullseye features, like this one here. And these are probably impact craters. Now, why would they form in a band? Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe the band is actually a function of the preservation of features that once covered the entire surface, but have been buried or otherwise erased. 
Now, more on this in just a minute, because this is a very important observation for Pluto. And third, there's this enigmatic polygonal feature, as NASA calls it. And in fact, it's a symmetrical hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, and the sixth one is hidden. Now, I've recently explained to this audience my views on hexagonal outlines as a simple function of the collapse mechanics of transient cavities that form as a part of the standard model of impact cratering. And in fact, I address this in a, a tandem uh, a presentation with Mike Wirtz. It seems that NASA still can't face up to the fact that the hexagonal impact features occur throughout the solar system. For example, some 20% of all lunar impact craters are symmetrical hexagons, as opposed to circular in plan view. But that's another story. Next one, please. Now, New Horizons did not image the entire surface of Pluto. It imaged about 40% in its flyby. But this view is quite distinct from the previous image and illustrates a number of new observations. First, note that this dark equatorial belt, th these are the same image, by the way, just this has labels and this does not. Notice how, as you go around, it actually breaks up into patches. I'll come back to those in just a moment. Those patches are in the order of several hundred kilometers across, by the way. And this is a key feature that I'm going to emphasize in a minute or two. Also in this image, NASA notes the presence of possible impact craters, as it says here. Although the impact crater density is anomalously low, indicating that the dwarf planet's surface is relatively young. In other words, relatively recent geological activity has erased its early history. Given Pluto's small size and its context where it sits in the solar system, this was an unexpected surprise. In fact, it was a scientific shock. More on this in just a moment, because this is a key feature. And thirdly, note the arrow up here, pointing to a bright patch referred to as the bright heart on the northern horizon. Next slide, please. If we can get the next one. Thank you. So you've seen this one before. This is a face-on view of the heart, informally named Tombao Regio. Regio just means uh, region, after Pluto's discoverer. It's a large patch of smooth ice with zero impact craters. Hence, it must be relatively young. And in fact, the estimate is younger than about 100 million years. And by the way, it's not a single patch. It turns out that this lobe here is actually a slightly different composition from that lobe there, although they're both dominated by nitrogen ice. In addition, it blankets older features in the underlying material, which Al has already pointed out to us is actually water ice. Now, this young ice is essentially a cryovolcanic, cryo is Greek for ice, volcanic, you already know, a cryovolcanic blanket of ice erupted onto the surface from the dwarf planet's interior. This requires that the insides of Pluto are hot enough to at least partially melt ice in the frigid conditions of the outer solar system. And we're talking something like minus 200, minus 250 degrees centigrade on the surface of this dwarf planet. Next one, please. And this, this heat inside Pluto, is the number one thematic problem for solar system formation that the New Horizons flyby has highlighted. What is generating the internal heat in a dwarf planet that until a few weeks ago was supposed to be old, cold, and dead? Next one, please. Now, an analogy with the Jovian moan Europa immediately springs to mind. That's this one up here. As many of you know, it's an icy moon. However, if you examine the models for the internal structure of Jupiter's principal moons, the Jovian moons, you can readily see that Io, Europa, and Ganymede are internally differentiated bodies with a dense core, a less dense mantle, and then an even less dense outer crust. The interior of Callisto, on the other hand, is made of homogeneous rocky material, presumably still representing the original accreted uh, chondritic meteors and asteroids. Now, this is a critical observation again. Io, Europa, and Ganymede are relatively close in with respect to the enormously powerful gravitational pull of Jupiter. It is this gravitational influence that periodically squeezes the moons and heats them up internally, thereby allowing them to melt internally and differentiate. The heavy stuff goes down to the core and the light stuff comes up to the surface. Callisto being further out 
is less squeezed and therefore internally colder. Hence, it has not melted nor differentiated. Now, Pluto may or may not be differentiated in its rocky component, but it still requires internal heat for its surface to be geologically active. However, it's not orbiting a nearby giant planet, which raises a thorny issue for planetologists. What? is the source of internal heat that allowed the dwarf planet to remain geologically active until the present day. Before you ask, no. Gravitational tidal interaction between Pluto and its moon Charon is insufficient to account for the required internal heat. So is any interaction between Pluto and Neptune or Uranus, the giant planets whose orbits it actually inter inter interferes with. Right now, nobody is guessing how to explain the internal heat. Believe it or not, not even me. Despite this major unresolved issue, now let, let's now take a closer look at the geological activity itself on Pluto's surface. Next one, please. If the source of Pluto's internal heat is enigma number one, here's enigma number two. The dark equatorial band presents itself as a series of splotches, dark splotches, a couple of hundred kilometers across each one. But here's the key point, periodically spaced. And it's this periodicity of distribution around the equator that's getting planetologists scratching their heads. Analogy with other icy bodies in the solar system suggests that the dark stuff is hydrogen. As Al said, they're calling it tholin. In fact, the idea of tar on Pluto was predicted five years ago, long before this probe ever got anywhere near the dwarf planet. The head scratcher is the even spacing of the spots. So. Here's my highly speculative take on this. Next one, please. Some of you may remember a talk I gave here a decade ago, actually more than a decade, I think it was 15 years ago, on the moon and the origin and distribution of its basalt lavas, especially on the face that, that faces us. I showed you an experiment I'd done many years before that at Carlton University, where light sump oil, the black stuff here, this literally is sump oil out of a truck, was allowed to rise through an overlaying or overlying layer of denser honey. Now, the reason it rises is that that's what light stuff does, overlain by denser stuff in a gravitational field. So as it rises, next slide, thank you. As it rises, the top of the sump oil in this experiment develops sinusoidal perturbations, which by definition have a regular spacing. And that is a function of the density difference, the viscosities and thicknesses of the respective layers and the strength of the gravitational field. Next one, please. And so you end up with this regular spacing, as you see here in the end result. Next slide, please. Now, imagine for the sake of argument that the black layer was the denser layer and that it overlies less dense material. So imagine this is the surface and it's dense material, and this is inside the planet, or the, the dwarf planet, and it's lighter. All I've done, in reality, is I've just flipped my slides upside down. But we're going to imagine that this illustrates cold, denser ice in the outer part of, the, 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 of Pluto, overlying warmer, less dense ice on the inside. Next one, please. So we get a similar pattern established at the interface between the two ices in the presence of a gravitational field. The but the phenomenon we're imaging here is one of periodically spaced sinking rather than rising. Next one, please. Now, in the real world, of course, there wouldn't be a, a hard surface over the top of my experimental box. There'd be a free surface, the surface of the planetoid. And that would mean that the free surface would sink, too, right above the downwelling denser ice. Next one, please. Hence forming basins with a regular spacing. Why would the spots be regularly spaced along the equator? I don't know. Possibly there's a long, thousands of kilometer long fault system that provided a structural weakness that allowed the vertical motions to focus there. Next one, please. Now with this speculation in mind, and remember, it is speculation, OK? Take another look at those spots in inverted commas. I don't call them spots. NASA does. They're not just featureless splotches. They have a very definite structure. Look at this one here. There's a nice large part of the splotch there, another large one there, and a very wide channel in between. And look at this one. This, there's one splotch, there's the next spot, and there's a channel in inverted commas going between. 
Where have we seen patches of hydrocarbon like this elsewhere in the solar system? Next slide, please. Now, it's unfortunate that we couldn't actually get this running properly because normally that would be spinning. But this is Saturn's moon, Titan. And this is three different hemispheres of Titan. And you can see these dark splotches. And between the dark splotches, there are channels which are linking from one to the other. There's a nice uh, close-in view of one of them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying for a minute that these are lakes of, of hydrocarbons. They're not. The hydrocarbons are actually presently preserved, in the, 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 or at least the liquid hydrocarbons are, in the northern and southern hemispheres. But they do indeed appear to be lake beds. So I leave you to draw your own speculative conclusions as to what these dark spots on Pluto really are. Meanwhile, while you're thinking about that, next slide please, let's take a look at enigma number three. Pluto has highly localized mountainous regions, as Alan has shown us, located adjacent to the heart-shaped area of Tombo Regio. So let's now take a look at both the mountains and the cryovolcanic heart. All righty, you're going to be going initially over the, the, the mountains. See these mountains here? These mountains here, they're not mountain chains. They're not uh, bands of, of hills. They're random looking blotchy, blocky things sticking up there. As Alan said, they're three and a half kilometers high. They are made of water ice. I'll come to that in just a moment. But you can see that although they've been compared with the Rockies, they don't have that chain-like look. And this is very important. This, by the way, is lack of data, and it's going to die out. This is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the heart over here, Tombao Regio. But this is just lack of data. Now we're going to go over the Sputnik Planum flyover. This is the northern part of one of the lobes of the heart. And you can see it's very smooth. There are no impact craters. But look at these chains of pits here with something dark in them. But look at this. The whole area is divided up into large polygons. And these are large. I'm talking 10, 30 kilometers by 100 kilometers. It's a polygonal region. We're coming to a lack of data there. And since we are a little short on time, if we can kill this now, and then move back to the presentation. All right, so following up on that video, here's an overview of the distribution of the mountainous Norgate Montes area and the smooth craterless and therefore young Tombao Regio region with its northern domain. This is Sputnik, Sputnik Planum up here. And you can see the, uh, the, 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 the polygonal area we were looking at. We're going to have a look at this in just a minute. Be aware that, as you can see here, this is a very small region of Pluto, and therefore it may not be representative. Next one, please. So these Norgate Montes mountains, they're up to three and a half kilometers high. Unlike the Rockies which, with which they've been compared, solely on the basis of height, by the way, they form a chaotic field of bumps as opposed to long, continuous mountain ridges. Note that the linear troughs here to the lower right these are the mountains. These are the linear troughs. They're lower in elevation than the mountains, and they seem to represent negative as opposed to positive relief. And that could have been formed by stretching of the dwarf planet's surface. Now, this suggests that unlike the Rockies, the mountains did not form by a horizontal push. Note that on account of their height, if the mountains are made of ice, it must be water ice. And this is simply because the other ices methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, are too weak, even at Pluto's temperatures, to support the weight of the mass of such high peaks. And this, by the way, is the primary evidence of the presence of water on Pluto. Next one, please. So if Norgay Mount Montes did not form by horizontal compression, which is how most mountains on the Earth form, then how did they form? Well, let's speculate. After all, why stop now? <laughs> Where do we see similar terrain to Norges, Norge Montes elsewhere in the solar system? Well, this might surprise you. How about here, on Earth's, in Earth's Arctic? Ice across the Arctic can rise as localized hills called pingos. This is a single hill of pure ice. But they only rise to a height of about 50 meters. Simple calculations could have been done, I don't know, to test this as a possible mechanism for the chaotic and highly localized mountains of Pluto. And maybe this has already been undertaken and found wanting. No one's talking about it. Next slide, please. 
So what are our other speculative options for explaining these chaotic looking mountains that look nothing like mountains on Earth? Well, when I hear chaotic and highly localized, I immediately think of weird terrain. That's weird as in, you are very strange. Weird terrain, and that is the technical term, is a localized area of jumbled rocks, each about five to 10 kilometers across, and up to two kilometers high in solid rock that occurs on the surface of Mercury. And it occurs diametrically opposite to the giant multi-ring Caloris impact basin. And it formed as a function of the refraction and focusing of the seismic waves generated by the massive impact. The, the, the seismic waves came around the, the, the other side of the planet, met, and then threw huge blocks, literally up, I was going to say into the air, but it's Mercury, so threw them up into space. They then fell back as a jumbled, weird mess. This is a picture of the chaotic terrain from Mercury. Is this what Nogue Montes represents? Next one, please. So what about the heart-shaped Tombao Regio, and in particular the patterned northern part known as Sputnik Planum? Well, this is a smooth area free of impact craters, and as I and Al have already said, hence it must be relatively young, less than 100 million years old. It represents a resurfacing of the dwarf planet's surface by nitrogen ice erupted from the interior, analogous to lava flows on Venus, hence the term cryovolcanism. However, NASA-associated scientists seem to prefer an analogy with glaciers, an analogy with glaciers on Earth and on Mars. It's true, the flow of the ice around uh, uh, what we would call here on Earth, Monadnox, sort of the, 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 the basement terrain here sticking up through the nitrogen ice, that would fit with either interpretation, glacial or volcanic. But the cryovolcanic model provides us with a ready source of ice, the interior of Pluto, whereas the glacier model doesn't. You have to rain the ice out of the atmosphere to make the glacier in the first place, and no one's proposing anything that could do that. But there's more to see here. Let's, uh, uh, let's, let's, uh, first of all, let's move to the next slide, please, and note the commonly elongate polygonal patterns. There's the scale, that's 20 miles, which is what, about 35-ish kilometers? So this polygon here is easily 35 kilometers across and a good 100 plus kilometers long. That's the scale of these things. But notice how the polygon boundaries have evolved. See this chain of pits through here? See how that two pits have actually already linked to start to form a little channel? Well, if you look through, you can actually see how all of these channel areas have evolved the same way. You can see the chain of pits there. And then eventually, you actually end up with little islands of material caught in there. These pits, by the way, are about a kilometer across. The dark stuff undoubtedly would, again, be uh, a hydrocarbon material. Next slide, please. Now, we've seen something like this before on Mars, where fractures guide the emplacement of magmatic dikes that freeze below the surface, creating subsurface voids into which material collapses to form pit chains like these here and there, which then coalesce to form these channels, these, the, in fact, <laughs> these rifts. This might suggest that the polygons on Pluto are defined by faults associated with subsurface voids of whatever origin. But remember, on Pluto, we're dealing with ice, and ice can sublimate. As Frank asked about nitrogen, it's nitrogen ice that's sublimating to form the tail that's trailing behind Pluto. There's no problem with getting the ice out of, this is not ice, this is Mars, this is rock. But on the Pluto version, there's no problem in actually getting the material out of the holes and, 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 and off the planet. Whatever, this possibility has to be incorporated into any explanation of the polygons of Pluto. Next one, please. However, Right now, NASA-associated scientists are not thinking straight. Some have suggested, in fact, most of them have suggested that the polygons might be contraction features, and they're comparing them with mud cracks. You all know what mud cracks look like in a drought. Well, this makes no sense whatsoever. Mud cracks are hand to dinner plate size. It's true that there is a thing called polygonal terrain in the Canadian Arctic, but there the polygons are the size of this room, maybe the size of the car park for the museum. 
polygons uh, in, the, in the Arctic tundra are up to about 100 meters across, but on Pluto, these polygons are 10 to 100 kilometers in scale. The only appropriately scaled solar system analog that comes to mind is the polygonal terrain on Mars. And that terrain still defies explanation. Here's the polygonal terrain from Mars. And these polygons here are of the order of 10 to 100 kilometers across. But nobody has an adequate explanation for them. Next one, please. Finally, this is my last slide. This is the only decent image available for Pluto's moon Charon, and it says it all. This, by the way, is the one that Alan showed as well. We're all showing this same picture. This tiny body should be dead as a doornail. But though it does indeed sport impact craters, they're few and they're far between. As for Pluto, its surface appears to have been geologically active in the recent past. Most interesting are the canyons with their troughs and cliffs. Look at this canyon system here. This is a thousand kilometers long by tens, uh, uh, tens in the plural, of kilometers across. And here's one up here that they consider is up to 10 kilometers deep. How did they form? The options are numerous. Collisions, global expansion. There's ways of actually getting the ice to expand and getting a, 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 a planetoid like this to actually expand in radius. Tidal stresses generated by the pluton sharon system, we just don't know. So it's going to be interesting to see what the theorists come up with in their computer models. Well, that's all I have for you for now. But we can expect to receive more data over the next year and a half. Most importantly, whatever you may think of what I've suggested to you tonight, remember it's all pure speculation based on minimal data. And it may all be wrong. Thanks for listening. Can you take a, one quick uh, question, maybe? Right. Paul? Simon, uh, you, you, you mentioned that uh, that tidal feeding due to the orbit of, of its moon is insufficient. But Pluto itself has a highly elliptical orbit. So could the gravitational end it, uh, differential uh, between the near point and the far point with the sun uh, generate sufficient internal heat to cause some of that uh, morphology? Bottom, bottom line, I don't know. S uh, second bottom line, I would assume that they've already calculated this one. Third bottom line, intuitively, we're talking 200 and something years for this orbit, which That's means not very long, though, I mean. to actually retain the energy derived from the initial squeeze and build it up. It's not the same thing as Io whipping around Jupiter right. in, what, a couple of days? And uh, e e even at the distance of Callisto, Callisto is still subjected to the, the gravitational effects of Jupiter, but it's far enough out that it's stone cold inside. I would very much doubt that the sun could do it. But you're putting your finger on the number one enigma that's come out of the New Horizons uh, mission. Nobody expected to see a geologically active planetoid or minor planet, and even less, a geologically active moon, Sharon. And this is going to have them scratching their heads and coming up with all kinds of crazy explanations. You know, stand by, we're going to see far more. The speculation I've given you tonight is going to be conservative compared with trying to explain why this small planet, a minor planet, is still geologically active and warm inside. Thank you, Simon. I'm sure Simon will be around after the meeting to answer more questions. Let's go right to Bill Wagstaff. He's going to give an update on the uh, RAC observing programs. Bill? Thanks again, Simon. Thank you, Mike. Um, I've, uh, I've done this, uh, I think, once at least, perhaps even twice before. Um, but uh, a bit of updated information. Uh, my talk tonight uh, primarily arises out of uh, a discussion that was happening in preparation for uh, some of our most recent National Council meetings. Uh, a uh, report by the National Observing Committee was uh, being discussed, and there were a few changes being suggested to the program. So I brought that to the uh, attention of the executive of the center and was asked to uh, perhaps come up and update uh, what I had said previously about the programs. So uh, first off, um, the uh, national level RASC offers a number of 
uh, certificates for observational achievements. Uh, basically, for each of the certificates, and we see uh, the emblems for uh, four of them here on the slide, as well, there are a couple more that don't have official emblems, but nevertheless exist. Uh, for each of these programs, there's offered a uh, list of objects or uh, items to be observed, and uh, on completion of the requirements of the program, uh, the member is uh, sent a certificate that's suitable for framing. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, the intent of the programs, the reason why they exist within the RASC is, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Primarily, it's oriented around the, uh, the intent of the uh, national level to encourage observational astronomy amongst all of us. Uh, it's, it's one of the key goals of the society itself. Uh, there's a couple of aspects to that. Uh, one of them is uh, just to promote active observing, give you uh, a bit of a goal to uh, work towards when you're out, outdoors under the stars. Uh, secondly, uh, through uh, imposing a few constraints on how you go about doing that, the, the intent is to encourage you to develop what, uh, what are considered good observing practices. In particular, the ability to uh, go from a printed chart or from uh, uh, some sort of guide uh, find some easier to find objects and then go, uh, go through the process of what's called star hopping to jump to uh, a less known objects, objects you're not familiar with and eventually find your way to the object of, uh, of interest that you're trying to find. Brian, uh, during his talk earlier this evening, was uh, giving us an illustration of how you might do this when he was talking about the uh, interesting feature, the, the arc of small stars that you could use as a guidepost on your way to finding Pluto in, in that particular view. So uh, in the same way, those practices are being encouraged through the program, and they're kind of a prerequisite for achieving most of the certificates. In, in the past, it was a prerequisite for achieving all of the certificates. Um, and thirdly, uh, the intent is to encourage programs within the centers themselves, uh, uh, eventually resulting in the formation of observing committees within centers. Some centers have them. Uh, I'm not sure if we have an active one here in Ottawa right now. We did have, certainly, in the past, and I'm sure we will have again in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's a very simple set of rules that uh, are used to guide your achievement of these things. Basically, they are um, you need to you need to have your own logbook, and you need to when you observe an object, actually write down a record of that, and and in your own words, you know, describe what you're seeing. It's an assurance to uh, someone who's granting the certificate that you didn't just make the whole thing up. You've actually you know, made the effort and, and gone out and observed these objects. Um, the second item has to do with how you find the objects, and basically the idea is don't use a computerized scope to just point the scope at the object of interest and look through the eyepiece. You're, you're intended to become more and more familiar with the sky by, by actually uh, doing your star hopping, looking at the star charts, becoming familiar with where each object is uh, in relationship to other parts of the sky. So, <clears throat> excuse me, starting, uh, starting large with constellations and working your way down until you find the individual object you're looking for. Um, the, uh, the third requirement has to do with how much you have to do to achieve a certificate. Uh, some of the programs have a mandatory list and you just need to find everything on the list and describe it. Uh, others, uh, especially the more introductory certificates, you have a selection of objects that you can go through and you only need so many out of that list to achieve the certificate. That's especially nice about the beginner uh, certificates, uh, the, the easiest ones, because they allow you to start at any time of year as soon as you develop an interest in that certificate, and you can choose objects that are gonna be visible at that time of year and achieve the certificate within a reasonable amount of time. Three to six months is typically talked about for some of the lower level certificates. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the recent change had to do with the report of the uh, observing committee. 
who proposed uh, that the uh, requirement for star hopping be eliminated for the two most difficult certificates that are uh, being provided. The, uh, the rationale for this had to do with the level of difficulty actually observing some of the objects that were involved. Uh, even if you're given a telescope that's pointed right at uh, the object in question, uh, it often requires significant star hopping effort within the field of view just to locate the object. Uh, many of them are uh, very difficult to see uh, and you could easily overlook them in a, a properly pointed telescope. As well as that, these are uh, considered the most advanced of the certificates and for the most part, by the time you've gotten to the point where you're going to be doing this, the society is pretty sure you already know how to star hop and, and you know, so really making that a requirement um, typically just made it a lot more difficult for people. Um, uh, an example might be uh, some of the objects that are required in the, uh, the more advanced lists uh, require quite a large telescope. You might only get an opportunity, for example, to look through Mike Wirth's 18-inch uh, telescope once in a while when you run into him at a star party or visit him uh, down south. It's highly unlikely that after the effort of getting his, uh, his scope pointed at a particularly difficult object that he's going to be happy with you climbing up on the ladder, pushing it off to a random part of the sky so you can star hop back to the same field of view to, to try and find the object. So it was felt that uh, with the difficulty of finding uh, instruments that are suitable for observing some of these things, it really didn't make sense to have this uh, star hopping requirement as well. So uh, after some discussion, you can look at the minutes from the meeting if you're interested in that sort of thing. But it has been decided now to drop the star hopping requirement for uh, the two most advanced certificates. Um, however, you're still not supposed to use a go-to scope to, to find them. That's basically, um, if you can uh, get a scope pointed at the right field of view, if you can actually find the object within that field of view, check it off, write down your observations on that, and you can include it in your, your list. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so just uh, quickly running through, I'm not going to read everything on these slides, but we're going to look at a brief description of each of the uh, certificates that are offered. And I'm starting from the uh, what are considered the, the, the least strenuous, and we'll work our way through to the most uh, difficult in the list. So the, the starting one, which has been around for not too terribly long, is the Explore the Universe certificate. Um, it, uh, it includes a significant list of possible objects that you can uh, look for. Uh, however, you're required to uh, achieve uh, only half of those. So it's very convenient for people starting out. As I say, you can start any time of the year uh, and you can uh, start writing down your observations and typically complete a sufficient number of uh, objects within a reasonable amount of time, perhaps three to six months, something like that. That's with Ottawa weather, for example, which you know you only get to observe about once in a blue moon. So uh, there it is. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, you know this is an example of the uh, certificate that is issued uh, on completion of the Explore the Universe uh, certificate program. Uh, this one, of course, is a sample and is filled out with kind of bogus information, but you get the idea. Most of these certificates are uh, marginally suitable for framing. I don't know, not everybody these days is dying to have a, a certificate of this sort hanging on the wall. Uh, all I can say is, um, you know, for most of these, it's really about the journey. It's not about the certificate you get at the end. You know, there are those people who enjoy them, but really what what we're doing here is becoming better observers and, and becoming more familiar with the sky, enjoying ourselves, really. Okay, next, please. Okay, the next uh, in difficulty, I guess, which would be considered an intermediate level uh, certificate, perhaps, is the Messier object one. Uh, essentially, this follows uh, Charles Messier's uh, uh, list of non-comets. He was a comet hunter uh, living in the 1700s, um, and he was uh, 
fairly often running across faint fuzzy things that were not comets and were kind of garbage in his field of view. Uh, so he made a list of them just so uh, he could ease his hunt for real comets by saying, oh no, that's another one of those. Let's not bother with that and carrying on. They've now become kind of a standard for intermediate observers to, to work their way through. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and a uh, suitable certificate is provided, a bit different from the previous one, but uh, nevertheless, the same sort of things can be said about that one. Uh, next slide, please. Next on is the finest NGC certificate. Uh, it has the same number of objects to be observed, and you need to observe all of them. Uh, it's basically an alternate, you might say, to the Messier objects. They're similar in difficulty, but they're different. They're kind of less known. Uh, the, the new general catalog was developed somewhat later than uh, Charlotte Messier's uh, list, but has uh, similar interesting objects. And you can see there are various types here. Next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of an actual issued certificate. This is for one of the members of our center who's earned this certificate. Um, uh, Chris, when uh, uh, preparing the initial uh, slide templates for me, happened to have a copy of this. I guess he was in on the awarding of this certificate, and so we thought, why not embarrass Pat by putting it up on screen? That's always fun. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, then um, one that's probably close to Brian's heart, the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program, a very extensive program, quite a large number of objects, uh, 150 objects to be found, objects um, perhaps it would be better to say features of the lunar surface. Uh, they range from very large features that can be observed with the naked eye uh, all the way down to some fairly um, small uh, features that can be seen. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, then we get into the more advanced, uh, the very advanced certificates. Uh, there are two of them. The first is Deep Sky Gems, and as you can see, there's 154 objects of various types that uh, one is expected to seek out and uh, write about in their logbook. Uh, next slide, please. And the last is the Deep Sky Challenge Certificate, uh, reasonably uh, recent development. And again, uh, not so many, 45 objects, but uh, of these, some of them are very difficult to observe. Uh, in particular, there is a requirement for one quasar observation that is considered quite difficult. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, as far as how many people in the society have these, have earned these, um, it's a pretty elite club. There's really not a lot of uptake through the, the membership for these of the number of, you know, uh, members there are. There's only a very few that have earned these. Uh, the one most commonly, uh, or the, that the most have been awarded, is the Messier Certificate. Part of the reasoning for that is that it's been around a long time. You can see that it was instituted in 1981. It's the earliest of all of them to be brought in. Uh, when you look at the rates at which they've been earned throughout the society, the, uh, the um, Explore the Universe certificate uh, and the Messier certificate have roughly been earned at about the same rate of about 10 per year uh, throughout the society. Uh, within our center in particular, I thought it interesting to just note how many of each certificate have been earned within the Ottawa Center. You can see that uh, there's not a heck of a lot of them. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, look at the list. There's a database online on the uh, RASC website where you can look for the names of people who have earned these, when they earned them, and what center they're from. So it's relatively easy to do these sort of searches. Um, of interest here, a uh, couple of things. On the Deep Sky Challenge, you'll notice there's six of them. The, uh, the inception of the award program was in 2008. That's also the year that the last one of them uh, was issued. There have been none issued since then. 
Uh, so it's very uncommon. Um, actually, prior to 2008, the society would uh, issue a letter of congratulations to people who completed the list. The list has actually been around longer than that, uh, was published a while ago. Um, however, uh, on the date of it being adopted as a certificate program, all of those people who had received certificates were, or pardon me, had received letters of uh, congratulations uh, were uh, sent a, uh, a uh, certificate and they were included in the list. So they, all of the other five, other than the one that was earned in 2008, all of those had been previously earned as a letter of, of uh, achievement and were retroactively issued. So really, since the program has come into being, one person earned it in the first year that it was there and nobody has done it since. Um, Deep Sky Gems, interestingly, in 2012 uh, was brought out. There has been only one of them awarded in the society. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty exclusive club having one of those certificates. Um, you know, I, I am personally uh, quite surprised at how few of the Isabel Williamson certificates have been issued. I, I suspect it might have to do with the number of, of observations that are needed. There, there, there are quite a few, plus there's some optional uh, observations as well. But uh, all of these, uh, especially Explore the Universe, are quite easily achievable. And I would encourage uh, people who are just getting started in observing, have been doing it for maybe a couple of years or that sort of thing, uh, do take a look at the list. It's not hard to achieve. It does give you focus in your observation attempts. And uh, I think you might very much enjoy going through the program. Eh, you get a little certificate. It's a little bonus at the end. Uh, next page, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, just a last question. What are we all waiting for? The, the program is out there. It's uh, very accessible. Uh, there's lots of materials for download, lists, guides, all that other information. I'd urge you to uh, take a look at the RESC National website. And, uh, you know, if you're at all interested, jump on in. Why not? One quick question from anyone or comment? Any questions? No. Nope. Uh, the one certificate awarded for me, David Levy's uh, Deep Sky Gems. Yes, John. Would that person be David Levy? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think he would be considered eligible, to tell you the truth. It just kind of seems a little too easy, doesn't it? But uh, I, I didn't write down the name, but uh, the, uh, the person's name is accessible through the uh, RASC National website. So feel free to take a look and uh, find out. Thank you, Paul. That's You're great. welcome, Mike. Thank you, Bill. Okay, let's um, let's uh, let's let's wrap up real quick here. So, um, uh, weather permitting, we'll have a star party tomorrow night. So, I'll put I'll put out the uh, go no go call on our website, and I'll also send it out onto the uh, the various astronomy uh, club lists. You can go to that tinyurl.com, and uh, it'll take you right to the star party website where we do post the go or go no, or no go. So, I'm not sure which way the weather will go. Okay. And it also, these uh, star parties, if you don't know, they're held in the, uh, par the, uh, the parking lot of the cart branch of the Ottawa Public Library, meaning, meaning right beside the Dieson Bunker Center. Okay, so cross your fingers. Next slide. Um, and uh, this map is on that website. Next slide. If you have any questions, come see me after the meeting. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, next, uh, click please. It's uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, yeah, tomorrow if, it, uh, if uh, the weather holds, or if not, uh, we have dates uh, next week on the 14th or 15th if it's uh, cloudy on the 14th. Okay, next slide. Thanks, next. Okay, uh, Estelle, who, um, Estelle Rother, who, who runs our, um, our, uh, our astronomy book library, uh, she's picked uh, this book uh, for, of, the, uh, of the month. And, and once again, as I say in pre all meetings, uh, if you wanna go check out that library, member or not a member, you can, you're certainly, as a non-member, you can go check it out. Uh, just go right behind here. Okay, you just go through behind the curtains here, and you'll see we have this uh, couple of cabinets that represent our library, but this, it's nicely stocked. Next slide. Pardon me? Just have one cabinet. Well, it's, 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 it's pretty full. We can get another one if you want, as you know. Um, I, I wanted to say a particular thanks to somebody who I don't, a couple I don't say thank to you enough to, and that's Art and Ann Fraser, who tirelessly, month after month, year after year, you know, um, 
uh, provide the, uh, the, uh, the cookies and refreshments uh, uh, at, at, at every meeting during the break and after the meeting. So, um, they, and they're there as they always are there. So thank you, Art and Ann. You certainly deserve that. I also, um, one other membership benefit is the uh, discounts for the Sky and Tell and uh, Astronomy magazines. Uh, if you go to that tiny URL address, it'll get you in touch with those people, and um, like Stuart Glenn in this case here, and uh, you'll be able to take advantage if you're a member of the uh, discount. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we meet uh, open to all uh, for a social event after the uh, meeting. One thing I wanted to mention before I uh, just remember Gordon um, is uh, Gordon uh, Webster and a couple others hosted a, uh, a, um, a star party at the Flow Observatory a couple of months ago. And during that in, in that session, um, Gordon mentioned that they, they were going to be organizing a star party at the at Plevna at the Plevna at the, at the September New Moon, right, Gordon? Okay, so um, if you are interested in that star, attending that star party, Gordon has a sign-up sheet, and I think it's up front here, or is it back of you, Gordon? Okay, it's right in the back uh, at the corner there, so, um, and Gordon can t provide more details. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, sign up, and uh, Gordon will be in touch. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, you can watch these meetings uh, uh, on, live on the internet, and by the way, Chris Tarrant is watching. He wasn't able to make it tonight. Hi, Chris. Um, by the way, uh, by the way, Brian McCullough, Chris wasn't uh, phased enough by the uh, the Pluto that uh, popped up. Um, we tried. Uh, ne next slide. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we do uh, have um, we do post in a, in a week or two or three um, the uh, these uh, recordings of these meetings on YouTube, and you can access that through our front page and get to something like this. Next slide. Uh, thanks to everyone, and, and in addition to what's shown on here, um, we miss, we're missing uh, Mike Earl and, and Janet Tulloch. Uh, so thanks to everyone for contributing. Next slide. Uh, next meeting is uh, the second Saturday, second Friday of uh, September. Uh, okay, so there, that's, we, uh, we don't have it on the long weekends. Okay, so after the Labor Day weekend. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're going to be starting the meetings at 7.30, coming in October. Which, um, okay, uh, next slide. Right. Next slide. Okay, um, we got a couple of really cool speakers uh, for for um, uh, for um, the next meeting, September meeting. Uh, Carmen, who is uh, who's had her series of astronomer um, uh, uh, prominent um, speakers and in, uh, in prominent figures, I should say, in uh, in astronomy. She's going to be uh, focusing on Gerard. Help me here. I always mispronounce his last name. Kuiper. Kuiper, okay, I, I did it. Uh, and Chuck O'Dale is going to be sharing some of his experiences uh, over many years um, uh, observing um, or, or visiting crater sites. And by the way, I've got some really cool speakers lined up for uh, one for November. I'll, I won't tell it now because we're out of time. And uh, I'm working on somebody for October. Stay tuned. Okay, uh, next meeting. Next slide. Okay, um, that is it. Uh, so we formally closed the meeting. I apologize for running over. That's something I really do not like doing. Uh, we're going to do the door prizes uh, right now. So if you give me a moment, I'll put out some of the door prizes and we'll call out the tickets and uh, go from there. Goodbye to everyone on the webcast. Goodbye to everyone on the webcast. Okay, thanks everyone.